Hello, welcome everybody to this almost last lecture about moduli. So <clears throat> thank you for your patience and uh, everlasting interest. So we will do the class today and again next week and then we will have the Easter break and this will give us the opportunity to make an end to this endeavor. Okay. So today, as I already sent you in the email, we will discuss the universal family for our moduli space. And we will prove that when we project from yn plus 1 to yn, I'll explain in a moment how this works, that this projection has fibers where stable curves appear naturally. And stable curves were defined by Delin, Mumford, Knudsen. And so it shows that <coughs> first we recover their theory, and our moduli space yn is actually isomorphic to the compactification m0n of Delin, Mumford. Okay. So a funny thing happened. Actually, I, I thought of, of presenting this result last week. And two weeks ago, so we had a kind of sketch or idea of proof. But when preparing the lecture, I realized that the proof is by far not complete. Actually, it had a one portion which was OK, but there was still something missing. And we knew that something was missing. And then it turned out that this missing part was harder than expected. And I was trying around and fooling around. and. Uh, did not really work. And then I just stared at the phylogenetic tree again and again. And suddenly I saw it must go like this. No? It almost told me how to proceed. And uh, that's a very privileged situation, because you have a kind of help desk, which tells you in each step of the proof what you should do. So I will try to transmit this a little bit today and next week. Okay. So uh, let me start. I think we are March 30 today. So let n capital N and think of 1 up to n be the set of labels of yn. Now here, the elements, I will write them as y or x. Maybe I think I start with x. And this is a string of n-gons, which are indexed by triples t a triple in n. And we want to go from yn to yn plus 1. So let n prime, or maybe sometimes I write n plus 1, n union a be the set of labels of yn plus 1. Recall that yn was a set of labels, a set of strings of n-gons which have equal cross ratios. Cross qxt equals cross qxs for all st for all q. You remember. So now we get a projection map which I will call pi or pi a. It refers to this label a which goes from yn plus 1 to yn. And <clears throat> we forget two things, forgetting all entries involving 
the label A. And there are two types of involvements. So let me write here an element as y. So this upstairs I will write y's, and below I will write x's. So this will be n plus 1 gons, and now t is indexed by n plus 1 over 3. So these are n plus 1 gons in P1. And uh, when you go down here, uh, maybe I call this x equal pi a of y. So how do we obtain this? First, we take only those n plus 1 gons which do not involve a. So where the triple does not involve, <coughs> let me write it like this, xt, t now in n over 3, where, of course, the set of triples in, in n is contained inside here. So already we forget all those where t involves a. And let me write it like this, y, yt equals xt. We take the first n components, and then we have yta. I write here, when I write n union a, think of this as 1 up to n, and then the new label a. Okay. So I repeat, we forget, first we delete all n plus 1 gons where t involves a. And from the remaining ones, we cut off the last entry. Okay, That's this projection map. And this will, this will be our universal family. OK. So the theorem, and this again, I repeat, this was obtained together with Josef Schicho and C.I.U. Key, is that the fibers of this map are stable curves. So for x and y n, The fibers, let me call them f x pi a inverse of x inside y n plus 1. And I'll be more precise, our unions of smooth rational curves, which just means isomorphic to p1s, if you don't want to think about anything else. So you just take p1s to lines, projective lines, meeting transversally. with dual graph equal gamma of x, the phylogenetic tree of x, or what we also call the incidence graph. So let me explain in more detail. Maybe I change my color. So <clears throat> you have to think of it as follows. Now I draw these p1s as curved, like this, maybe. Uh, 
So these all these are p1s, and only two will always intersect. Yeah. Of course, you could have several uh, intersections, but in different points. Okay. And you don't have a loop. So what would be? Let me call. Let me note these. Let me count these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This would be f of x. You have to imagine it like this. And uh, what about the the dual graph? You take now the components. You have seven components, so you draw points. Uh, I think I want to do it maybe like this. One, two, four, seven. Now let's see. How are the connections? One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven. So one intersects two, so we get an edge here. Uh, and one intersects three. Oh, I, uh, this was not very good. My notation was. Let me change this here. Sorry. I want to have it opposite. I want this one to be one and this one to be two. Ah, uh, no. Come on. This is 1, and this is 2, and this is a p1. So 1 is connected to 2. 2 will intersect 3. 3 will intersect 4. 4 intersects 5. And 5 will not only intersect 4, but also 6 and 7. Okay, So that's a kind of boring tree. This is a phylogenetic tree. without leaves. So it's a naked tree, a winter tree. You agree? It's a winter tree. So where are the leaves? The leaves, I'm not going to do them today, but we will also have to define points, which I draw in red. Yeah. So these will be the end points later or next week. In addition, have to construct endpoints on the fiber to get is an endpointed stable curve to get endpointed stable curve. So this means that you have, again, a configuration of components like this. And the points have to be in a way that you have at least three special points on each component. And then, of course, this should correspond to here we need also another one. Maybe here we have three. So then we would get the leaves. Five has no, four has, has one, three has one. Oh, there is something missing. Let me do here two. And then we have, here we have two, and here we have one. OK? So that's the red part. I'm not going to do it today. Yeah. That's a separate story. Actually, we still have to figure it out in deta detail. What we will do is just the blue picture today. Okay. So this here is a dual graph. And whenever you add the leaves, then we call it the augmented dual graph. 
OK? Everything clear so far? So I just have a, maybe it's a bit of a tangential question. Because you said it was a phylogenetic tree without leaves. And I'm a bit stuck on this, because I think that you can make any tree into a phylogenetic tree if you just attach the right number of leaves to every vertex, right? Yes, of course. Of course, but you could, could, you could add more leaves than necessary. Yes, of course, but yeah. I was just confused about this, and this is a phylogenetic tree without leaves. Yeah. Because I thought that every tree was a phylogenetic tree without leaves. Yes, yes, yeah, maybe I should not write it. Maybe I do it like this. <laughs> yeah, it's a tree without leaves or something like that. I mean, I actually, the blue part, I give it a special name. I call it skeleton. OK. And the skeleton is, of course, extracted from the phylogenetic tree of x by forgetting all leaves and all edges of the leaves. OK? I'll come back to this in a moment. Thanks. OK, now I have to. Yeah, I think I keep this here for the moment. You have seen this already. And uh, I will draw the picture again later on, because I have to talk a little bit about this projection map. By the way, I think uh, one month ago or so, I gave you an exercise in counting triples or k-tuples such that any two are any, any consecutive k-tuples plus differ by one. Did you do this exercise? Uh, I did not get too many responses. Yes? But um, I always try to, um, so first I tried to count them like all at once, and that just didn't work because I always found that I was missing something or that I counted something double. Yes. And then I just got caught up in this um, trying to subtract those that I counted <laughs> doubly and triply, and I just. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a funny exercise because we are sure that it works. But to prove it is a little bit cumbersome. But we will use it today and next week again. So I hope that I will write a, a concise proof soon. So I, I think I already told you that the proof is not elegant. It's more like what in Austria, in Austria you call Bastelei. And then you don't want to write it up because it's not so beautiful. OK, so <clears throat> I, I have to, yeah, let me start with the proof. I hope that my yellow still works. Proof of the theorem. So the first thing which we need is we have to simplify this fiber. So we use the following lemma, which is not very difficult. We take a map tau a, which goes from p1. Now I take n plus 1 times n plus 1 to 3. And what we do is we keep the n plus 1 gons. So we will have p1 n plus 1. But we only take triples which do not involve a. So let me write this down. If y is yt t in n plus 1 over 3, then we just take, I don't know how to call it. Maybe I don't write anything. Y t, t in n over 3. So forget triples involving t. But we still keep these here will still be n plus 1 gons. OK. 
Okay. And this map, which is of course half of the map pi, has the following property, then tau of A restricted to yn plus 1 is an isomorphism onto its image. So tau A of yn plus 1 is isomorphic to yn plus 1. So that's not very difficult to prove. We will do it in a moment. But it tells you that in the fiber, yeah, which is sitting inside here, you could also take the image. So you could forget about the n plus 1 gons with t in n plus 1 and not in n over 3. And this simplifies a lot. Okay. So <clears throat> proof. So this is, I mean, it's so easy that the best would be you do it on your own, but I indicate you a little bit. We take T I G A, we take a triple, which is in n plus 1 over A, but not in n over A. And we have to show that the Y T, which appears here, can be recovered from this here. No? that here all the information is contained. So <clears throat> yt is n plus 1 gone of y. And now take k in n different from i and j. And uh, uh, the goal is have to express y t k yes y t k I will specify what is t as a function of y s all other n plus one gons but now s is in n over 3. Yeah. All s. Then we are done. No, because the image just sees the ys's and not the yt's. OK? Now, if you think about it at home, you will see that it's not so difficult. By our choice of t, we know that yti is 0, ytj is 1, and yta is infinity. And now we choose a suitable quadruple, choose q equals ijka. This was in n plus 1, 4. And uh, if we now compute the cross ratio, I'm running out of space. I hope you can read here. If you take the cross ratio with respect to this q of yt, now what is this? We just select here the entries yt i, ytj, ytk, and yta. But all are known except ytk here, yeah, because here we have them. Okay? So you plug this in, and what you are left with, these are constants. So only ytk will be left here in this ratio. So this is a rational function of ytk. And I think I computed it. It is bum, bum, bum. Actually, it is up to arrow ytk divided by ytk minus 1. But now recall, recall that 
yn plus 1 is also defined by the equality of cross ratios. So this one here is equal to the cross ratio of ys whenever both are defined, or s in n over 3. So this is something you know. Excuse me for writing here. This is, as we know ys, we know its cross ratio. And from this equality here, we can compute y dk as a function of this cross ratio, and hence as a function of ys. Okay. So this proves the lemma. Very simple, but a little bit tedious to write down. <clears throat> OK. I hope you copied this, because I want, still want to keep this part here. So again, let me, let me repeat. We can restrict in the fiber just to yt's, where the triple t belongs to n over 3. Now, before going on with the proof of the theorem, we will look at the phylogenetic trees. Uh, for the first time, and uh, we could ask the following. If you take a string y in yn plus 1, and you take its image x in yn, how do the phylogenetic trees correspond to each other? Very reasonable question. So where do I have my stick? This I will formulate it as a proposition. So again, y in y n plus 1, x equals pi a of y in y n. Then the gamma of x is obtained from gamma of y, you can almost expect it. So there's one leaf of y which has label A. And this is not allowed to appear here. So you take your scissors and you cut this leaf and throw it away. But then there might be a problem, because it could be that you have no longer a phylogenetic tree. So in this case, you have to glue a little bit again in order to make it work. It's obtained from them <coughs> as follows. And this I call it clipping of the leaf with label A. Let me make a drawing. This is, again, kind of fun. I take. <coughs> very simple minded so here we have gamma of y and i don't draw all the leaves only those which are relevant so let me have here a i j then we will have a situation where we just have two a and i. And then we might have a situation where we have a here alone. Or maybe I make even a fourth one, a and i, in the middle. And I think it's almost immediate what you do. And so on. I only draw 
the part where A appears. Okay, the other leaves are <coughs> not here. And then we will have gamma of x. Gamma of x. So in the first case, it's easy. You just forget about A. I, J. You clip it away, and everything is fine. In the second case, if you clip A, if you cut it off, this one will no longer have uh, degree 3. So you make, out of these two, you make just one outer edge. So it looks like this. And you will get here i. So you don't just clip, but you glue or you, you coalesce this at the blue edge with the yellow edge one. Now, here you expect nothing serious to happen, because we have a vertex here. Here you just forgot about A, you get I. And in the last example, now if you take away A, you again have a problem. So what you do is you these two edges become one edge. Okay. So in some in case two and four, you also reduce the number of inner edges and prove is easy. You just check it. Okay. But it's nice. It tells you that there is a precise relation between the two. Any further questions from your side? OK, <clears throat> again, I have to erase on this side. Uh, do I need this statement here still? I think for the moment, I don't need it. So let me, no. I think I can erase everything. So what about the time? Yeah, we will continue a little bit. Then I will start the proof, the actual proof of the theorem. But then we will make a short break and continue. OK, so let us take a string in the fiber. So continuation of proof of theorem. Let y equals yt, t in n plus 1 over 3 b in f of x, pi a inverse of our string x. And by the lemma, we can reduce, by 
as a lemma sufficient to consider. I write it for the moment y tilde. It's the same, but just t in n over 3. And we have to show that the set of all these y tilde, let me fx tilde, which was tau a of the fiber x like this. And to prove, and to prove that it is a union of P1s, so of course transversal with dual graph a gamma of x. Now comes the problem. Uh, da -di -da -da. Note that not yet the problem. Pi of y is x. And this x is fixed. This is in yn. It's like a constant. So this implies that yt can be written xt yta. Only the last component is free. Only yta free. And now we already reduced to the situation where t is in n choose 3. Okay, So this f tilde of x, after eliminating all this, lies actually up to isomorphism. Our <coughs> f tilde x can be seen as in p1 and 2, 3. I have to write it here because it's wet. Ah, it never works. It's, it's very embarrassing with this blackboard or lightboard. N true 3. And what are the equations? Now we already, already used that the image is x. So the only condition is that the cross ratios have to be equal. Yeah. So the equations for f tilde x are given by the equality of cross ratios. Cross u y s equal cross q y t for all s t in n two three for all q in n four. Okay. So as our yt and ys consists of this, this, this here can be rewritten as cross q xs ysa equal cross q xt yta. Okay. That's the defining the system of defining equations for the, this f tilde x. System of defining equations 
in how many variables? The variables are the YTA in variables YTA, T in N true 3, say N over 3 many. Now you see the problem. We have many, many equations. For each pair of triples S and T, and for all quadruples, we get equations. And what we want is that the zero set of this system of equations has dimension 1. So there must be a redundancy in these equations. So expect large redundancy in the system of equations. Many should be superfluous, redundant. Actually, what we would like best is to have precisely n true 3 minus 1 equations. Hope for n true 3 minus 1, let me call it significant equations. Uh, to define our fiber or the image of the fiber. But where are they? How do we find out of these significant equations? Yeah. Yeah. Recall here, as we have n true 3 variables, we need one equation less to get a curve. But it could be that this, this still is not OK. Maybe we would need more equations. It's not always like this, that the curve is defined by one less equation than the variables indicate. But here we will see it is like this. Okay. And the second thing, which is very, very embarrassing, is that this system of equation has to do something with the phylogenetic tree of x. So let me draw it. Uh, or maybe let me write it down. Uh, moreover, these equations, so th let us assume that we have these significant equations, these chosen distinguished equations should strongly relate to the phylogenetic tree gamma x of x. Now we have uh, <coughs> the following thing to consider. I will draw one such, one such tree. Maybe I need it afterwards. No, I think I can, I can fit it here. Let me take, just as an example, the following tree. For gamma of x. Yeah, it's even extremal, but yeah. And we have a couple of. I just draw very few leaves, actually only two. Okay. So now, if you look, if you compare these two things, do you see a problem? Now maybe I. I wait a little bit. So assume that we know how to choose these significant equations. There are n to 3 minus 1 many. But here in this picture, n to 3 does not appear. You have the number of vertices or the number of leaves, nothing to do with, I mean, of course, the number of leaves over 3 is n to 3. 
but it's not clear at all how this geometry should be related to these equations. No? That was the point. I mean, what we already had, we found n2, 3, minus 1 significant equations, but they had nothing to do with the phylogenetic tree. Now, this was a stage two, two weeks ago. And I thought, impossible. How I knew precisely, and I will show you how we find these significant equations. But then how to relate this to this tree seemed impossible. And then I looked at the tree, I looked again, I looked again, and suddenly the answer appeared for free after the break. We have a short commercial break, or you can drink something and we meet again in five minutes.
Okay, we are back again. I hope you are also back. And let me investigate this case a little bit. So I will draw again uh, our tree. Same picture as before. But now we will we will think a little bit about this. Let me take two adjacent vertices, w and v. So this here is the gamma of x. So recall that the vertices, if I write it in blue, the vertices should correspond to components of fx. I delete here the tilde. And the edges should correspond to intersections. of components. So to start understanding the situation, let us just take two vertices, v and w, and let's try to find an equation which reflects a little bit this behavior. And this is done as follows. Uh, we know that. These are orbits of n plus 1 gons. Sorry, this is, I should write here. No, we are still in x, so this is xt. OK. Now, s and t will be triples. Uh, in n to the 3, st, no, in n to the 3. Now we are still downstairs because this is the, the graph of, of x. Now the idea is to choose cleverly s and t among the leaves here and to choose also a quadruple so that we can compute the equation corresponding to the equality of cross ratios. So choose for the given v w vertices of gamma x <coughs> triples s t in n choose 3 such that, as I already wrote, v is xs, w is xt, the orbit of these n-gons. But we will do it in a clever way, namely such that s and t just differ in one entry, what I call adjacent, s and t adjacent two same entries. This will be the clue. So I will I will already know how to do it, so I will choose I here, I will choose J here, I will choose K here and L here. Okay. Then, as you see, v will be the meeting point of i, j, k. v is, you remember what the meeting point is? Meeting point of i, j, k. 
So when you, this is a unique point where you have three simple paths going to i, j, k. So this will then automatically x, s. And w is i, j, l, and hence it will be x, t. Of course, I'm choosing very specific triples. And now I will choose q equals qst. Now the, <coughs> the quadruple will involve uh, a, our label a. So we take i, j, l, a. And this is now in n plus 1 to the 4. So there is a, a symmetric choice. We could also choose uh, ijk a. It works in the same way. This is a single quadruple. And look at cross q y s equals cross q y t. This single equation. Now, we did this computation already. Let me write it again here. Cross q, this will be x s y s a. And this one will be cross q x t y t a. OK. So only two variables are involved. Okay. Let's see how this equation is. Now, a little computation. Gives and see earlier lecture. I think in this earlier version, I made a small mistake, but you get gives the equation. Now just in the two variables, ysa and yta, and I call it e upper st. Not very complicated, but still it's easily possible to make an error. So this will be ysa yta minus 1 equal to xsl times, so xsl is a constant, yta minus y, ysa. I verified it several times. It's correct. So this equation depends on xsl. Now note here that xsl is not, not given yet, because we just know xsi, xsj, xsk. If we would have chosen ijka, we would have an xtl here, xdk here. Okay. Now, what is this? So xsl is in p1 a constant. So what we do is we compute the singularities of this. So HST will be the zero set of EST inside P1 and Q3. Recall that in all together, we have n true three variables, y, s, a, y, t, a, and so on. So this is one equation, so it will be a hypersurface. And if we don't understand this hypersurface, we don't have to continue trying to prove that something is a curve. So the singular locus, so the singularities, where, where the points where it is not a manifold, singularities 
of HST are given by the zeros of the partial derivatives. So this is something if you are not familiar with this, but that's if if one partial derivative does not vanish at a certain point, then we have a smooth, locally smooth hypersurface at that point. And only if all derivatives vanish and the point where it vanishes lies on the hypersurface, then we will have a singularity there. Okay? So let us compute this. So the variables are y s a and y t a, so we take the derivative with respect to y s a. So that's easy. This is y t a minus 1 plus x s l. And we equate it to 0. And then we take the derivative with respect to y t a. And we get y s a minus x s l equals 0. But of course, we have to combine this these two equations with this equation. So we can compute yta and ysa from here. So resubstitution into est gives the following x s l minus x s l equal x s l. We just compute 1 minus 2 x s l. It's only an equation between constants. So now we will see this constant. This constant will decide over the position of the singularities in this hypersurface. Now, but this gives, if you simplify, you get xsl, xsl minus 1 equals 0, Okay, which means that this equation here, or the hypersurface here, is singular if and only if either xsl is 0, hence xsl is 0, or xsl is 1. Okay. I think I can erase down here. Let us keep the picture. So you see, I'm just computing. I'm not thinking. We just do whatever is dictated. So let me, for instance, take xsl equals 1. So if we plug this in here, for example, let us see how the equation looks like when xsl is 0. For example, taking xsl equals 1, we get e s t equal y s a y t a minus 1 equals y t a minus y s a. And this is equivalent if you, simp you can simplify and you get y t a times y s a minus 1 equals 0. And this is now an equation in p1 and true 3. 
So that's a very nice equation, because it tells you this hypersurface has two components. HST has two components. Yeah. YTA equals 0, which is just a coordinate hyperplane, or YSA equals 1, which is a parallel to a coordinate hyperplane. So you have two, two planes, two hyperplanes intersecting, intersecting where both uh, equations are satisfied. Okay. So we see now we have associated to this edge two components. This one here is a component where s is free, ysa free, which will correspond to this v. And here yta is free, which will correspond to the component sitting here. Right? So two hyperplanes. I repeat from this procedure, assuming always this xsl is 1, we would get two hypersurfaces, uh, sorry, two hyperplanes intersecting like this transversely. And in one, ysa is free. So this is naturally associated to this vertex v, which corresponds to xs. And the other one is where yta is free is here. Okay. Now, if you take xsl equals 0, uh, so yeah, sorry, here's something missing, equals 0, you will believe that you get a similar situation. Okay. But who tells us the value of xsl? No? We just took it by brute force, but we don't know it. Okay. We would like to have this intersection, two components intersecting transversely. So whenever you are lost, look at your tree. So what is the value? of xsl. If it is not 0 or not 1, we would not get an intersection of two a union of two components. So now let us look at the distribution of our leaves. We have i here, j here, k here, l here. And here is xs. So remember the rule. This is the incidence graph. I should write it in blue. The incidence graph of gamma of x. Huh? So what does this mean? If you, if you start here in v and you go along one edge, so this was this destination set, you remember, then the entries of xs corresponding to the labels which you reach here are equal. I repeat, if you have here i and i prime, being here means that xs i is equal to xs i prime. And the same for k and k prime over here. And the same over here. Okay? But here, if you go along here, j and l will lie in the same destination set. Yeah? or in the same incident set. Observe that j and l lie in the same incident set of xs. Not of xt. Because here you have a ramification. Uh, for t, it does not work. But for s, they lie the same. Hence, xsl is equal to xsj. So we know the value of xsl. 
because we know the value of x as j. Now, but s was i j k. So j is the second one, which means that x as j is 1. Remember, x as i is 0, x as j is 1, and x as k is infinity. And we get x as l equals 1, precisely as we want it here. So when I saw this, I thought that we are not mathematicians who just follow what is given on, the, on your sheet of paper. Okay? So at least in this very simple situation, we found one equation which does a nice job. It, it's not the proof yet, okay? but it, it gives you an idea how this works. Now, I will stop soon because it will be too much material. Uh, let me, it's not very good, but I will do it in any case. Let us now assume that inside here we have another vertex u, maybe xr. Okay, which means that we have maybe we need one more, at least one more leaf here, m. Okay. Then the whole story goes over again. Yeah, all this is the same, but the two components corresponding here and here should not intersect. We don't see it here, but I'm not sure if I can do it next time. But if you write down all the equations again, taking into account that you, here you have another vertex, you will see that having a vertex in between these two, the components corresponding to these two no longer intersect. Yeah? You have to choose again very carefully your quadruples, but it's really the, the adjacency, the neighboring of the vertices, which gives you the intersection of the components. Okay? That's not the whole story. Yeah? But I think today, at least, you have seen one of the key arguments, very elementary as usual, how these things work. Huh? So next time, I'm not sure if I will be able to finish, but in any case, we will look at all equations and see how we get precisely the correct number of significant equations. Okay? And I will try to explain also why, if you have two non-adjacent vertices, the respective components do not intersect. It's a little bit disturbing because you have not done anything to the equation by inserting this m here, but you will see how it works. Okay. So I think that's uh, far enough for today. I hope you enjoyed it a little bit. I wish you a very nice evening. And hopefully we meet again next week for our last uh, session. Uh, I'm not going, probably I can only indicate briefly how you construct the endpoints on your components. But at least I want to, to a certain extent, complete the proof of the theorem we did today. So selecting the correct equations and showing you that you actually get something of dimension n minus 1. And as you see, saw here, it was a key ingredient that the two triples s and t just differ in one entry. They have two equal entries, and one is different. And the q has one di entry different from t and two different from All this is fitting together nicely. If you take arbitrary s and t, then things are more complicated. OK, okay that's all for today. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh